welcome to all our attendees and i thank uh, our uh, platform uh, given by indian college of anesthesiologists it's a very proud moment that we are continuing with the education through this series of webinars uh, ever since 2020 so uh, without much ado i'll uh, invite our first speaker dr shilpa kasodikar she is a consultant at um, hinduja hospital car mumbai and she is the leading obstetric anesthesia there she is herself a fellow from of obstetric anesthesia from toronto canada and she is our uh, aoa executive member she has received number of publications and uh, she, and awards to her honor and she'll be today telling us how to set up labor analgesia what are the basics behind it over to you shilpa uh, thank you dr kajal for such a kind introduction so uh, first of all i would like to thank the ica indian college of uh, anesthetist to uh, conduct such uh, educational webinars so anyway without delaying so my topic today is uh, getting into the basics and bottom of the epidural labor analgesia okay so this is how i'll cover my topic why treat labor pain the pain pathways in the first and the second stage of labor how obstetric epidurals are different from the non obstetric ones then the minimal monitoring that is needed um, for all uh, uh, areas i mean for for uh, nursing homes for uh, bigger hospitals for teaching hospitals and i'll also cover about the basic labor analgesia setup that you should be having and a little bit background about the epidural labor analgesia okay so uh, when we talk about labor labor pain is so intense that um, uh, fortunately the megill university way back in 1971 came up with this megill pain index it's a scale rating pain developed uh, uh, to give good description of the quality and intensity of pain so the labor pain was considered as severe as amputation of digit as you can see here and uh, it is uh, much more in primary paras as compared to the multi paras so when the american society of anesthesiologist and other societies all over the world realized that the labor pain is so intense then uh, they came out with a statement that maternal request is sufficient medical indication to provide labor pain relief okay so let us understand the absolute basics of labor it has three stages the first stage is dilatation of the cervix and the second stage is delivery of the baby and the third stage is delivery of the placenta so when we talk about the pain pathways in labor we need to understand the first stage of labor now the first stage of labor it originates from the stretch of the lower uterine segment and the cervical dilatation the characteristic of the pain is it is mainly visceral in nature it is diffuse and poorly localized this pain is carried by a delta and c fibers and accompanying sympathetic nerves which enter the spinal cord at t10 11 12 up to l1 uh, nerve roots now the second stage of labor is mainly due to the descent of the fetal head subsequent pressure on the pelvic floor vagina and perineum and is mainly somatic in origin it is transmitted by pudendal nerve which is s2 s3 s4 uh, nerve roots so it clearly states that our ideal labor epidural block has to cover segments from t10 to s5 dermatomes with minimal motor block so so what does this labor do to the mother and the fetus so as you can see in this uh, uh, graphical or a chart where maternal pain stress and anxiety will cause hyperventilation in the mother leading to respiratory alkalosis in the mother which shifts the oxygen dissociation curve to the left causes apneic episodes and metabolic acidosis in the mother which ultimately decreases the oxygen transfer to the fetus ultimately leading to the fetal metabolic acidosis then secondly again this pain stress and anxiety releases catecholamines and cortisol which will cause uterine vasoconstriction um, then uh, fetal uh, free fatty acids will increase fetal hyperglycemia again leading to fetal metabolic acidosis now everything together decreases the placental flow and ultimately causes metabolic acidosis in the fetus so we need to stop this entire vicious cycle so uh, 
So a complete pain relief with epidural prevents transient periods of hyperventilation during contraction and prevents hypoventilation during relaxation, thereby maintaining maternal uh, normocarbia, which is eventually favorable for the fetus. So overall, when you look at the benefits of uh, treating labor pain, definitely it has uh, a fantastic maternal satisfaction. Who wants to tolerate pain? It clearly increases the uteroplacental blood flow, thereby better maternal and fetal outcomes. It stabilizes the maternal hemodynamics in active labor, which is especially beneficial in mothers with cardiac disease and eclampsia, PIH. Overall, it's an extremely joyous and satisfying experience for the mother and ultimately for us as anesthetist. So what happens if this labor pain is left untreated? So there are many publications and articles on this and the, the literature proves that these kind of mothers are more prone for chronic pain, postpartum stress syndrome, then undesired psychological and physiologic consequences such as postpartum depression. Now, untreated labor pain also leads to maternal cardiac output increase, systemic vascular resistance also in increases and the oxygen demand also increases. All this can be extremely detrimental for mothers with cardiac disease. So when we talk about, so basically we need something, a perfect analgesic agent. Okay, since labor is a physiological process, we need to maintain the physiology of labor as well as the progression of labor. Now, we need an analgesic agent which has a minimal adverse effect on the mother, the fetus, and the neonate. It should be easy to administer and needs minimum and easy monitoring of both the mother and the fetus. Now, since labor is a long and dynamic process, an agent which has consistent analgesic effect and can be dosed as per the dynamic needs of uh, ever-changing labor. So what epidural is considered ideal. Also, it should facilitate anesthetist uh, for converting the analgesic effect to anesthetic effect if you need obstetric intervention such as vacuum delivery, forces, forceps delivery, or if the patient is to be taken for cesarean delivery. Not only this, it shouldn't cause motor block and should maintain maternal expulsive efforts. So we have multiple options such as non-pharmacological as well as pharmacological. Of all this, <clears throat> epidural indeed is undoubtedly the gold standard because it fulfills all the criteria for uh, being an ideal labor analgesic agent, which I just mentioned. Now, it is specially indicated in obese parturians, uh, and it is highly recommended in them because they are at higher risk of obstetric intervention and also have high probability of difficult airway. So if you have a good working epidural, your life is much easier. You don't have to deal with um, putting an uh, epidural or a spinal in an emergency situation, or these particular patients um, are double whammy. They have, uh, they are obese as well as the uh, uh, physiological changes of pregnancy makes the airway difficult. Okay, now uh, uh, let us talk about the basic equipments that we need. Now, since epidural as well as the combined spinal epidural is a procedure which is close to the neuroaxial axis, strict sterility has to be maintained so as to avoid any kind of slightest risk of infection in these mothers. Thus, it is extremely important to, uh, proper, uh, to have a proper sterile surgical gown, mask, cap, and uh, wearing sterile gloves is mandatory. Uh, use of sterile drapes and swabs is a must. Uh, a cleaning solution, there's a lot of debate on chlorhexidine and betadine, and it has been proven that chlorhexidine 2% with 70% alcohol provides the best uh, uh, antiseptic, uh, is a best antiseptic agent for neurexial uh, epidurals and spinals. Um, it is advisable to use 18 gauge 2 he needles as compared to 16 gauge because, uh, God forbid, if you have a dural puncture with 16 gauge, it is extremely difficult to treat. Uh, the headache because it's a very big gauge needle and you may actually eventually need a epidural blood patch and of course a sterile epidural and a CSC pack is also needed. Now coming to the setup, now if you are in a small nursing home which has no single rooms then you should prefer putting epidurals either in a you know in your operation theater or a labor room or <clears throat> a clean area where there is not too much of uh, a rush of uh, patients coming in and going out. 
uh, IV access is must. Always run about 200 to 300 ml of ringers to prevent any uh, hypotension. A crash cart is uh, with all emergency drugs should be handy. And uh, a quick OT access is extremely important just in case you have fetal distress. For example, in my own setup, our uh, labor room and the OT is on, a, is on different floors. So we have been, we conduct these mock drills on and off to get a realistic time of transfer of patients to the labor room from the, I mean, to the OT from the labor room. And everybody, including the technicians, the anesthetists, the obstetricians, everybody is trained. So then after this, so if you have this kind of, um, um, you know, setup where your labor room is away from your OT, it is uh, advisable to do these mock drills. So you know exactly where, you know, your uh, where is the delay and where you can uh, sort out the problems. Now, basic monitoring of mother will include uh, uh, pulse saturation, blood pressure monitoring, and continuous fetal monitoring is important. So this is our labor floor. I work at Hinduja Hospital in Khar, Mumbai. Uh, it's so all the rooms will have laboring patients. So our single rooms are somewhat like this. So we can also uh, put an epidural in a patient's room. We just move our crash cart and the epidural trolley with monitor. If the patient is too early in labor, like one, two, three centimeters dilated, we we do it here so that the patient is comfortable with husband and you know other relatives in the room. Uh, that is equally important because it's a natural process. It's not a, a surgical thing where you need to segregate the patient uh, from the family members. So on the right, this is our labor room. Uh, you can see here, we have an intercom here. So if there is an emergency, we quickly um, can inform the operation theater. We have a spotlight, the white color thing. If you can see this one, there is a clock which exact uh, matches the Google uh, time. So you know the exact time of delivery. It's very important in Indian scenario. Uh, then you have a fetal monitoring here. This is maternal monitor. Then we have wall mounted oxygen um, suction and we have PCA and we also have Antonox cylinder here. Uh, so this is our crash cart and it has um, all the sterile preparation trays and the sterile gowns, everything is always ready 24 seven. So uh, on the right here, you can see this is the baby uh, warmer and a separate uh, monitor for the neonate once the baby is born. So other important thing is staffing and logistics. Um, so especially in a corporate hospital or um, in, a, in, a, in a private nursing home, um, it is uh, good to have uh, one is to one ratio of a laboring mother with a staff. If uh, it is, uh, most of the times it is not possible. So and sometimes in our hospital too, one nurse is looking after two laboring patients. Uh, in a setup such as a teaching hospital, it is, I think, very difficult to maintain this one is to one or one is to two ratio. But there as well, you can form your own protocols and train the nurses, the other medical staff, the the other anesthetists, the juniors, seniors, uh, to handle uh, these patients. And especially nurses should be trained in handling the epidural, uh, just in case they need to stop it immediately, or they need to you know, change the rate, though it is not uh, advisable that nurses should be handling the epidural. But in cases of emergencies, they should be able to do it. Of course, oxygen and full resuscitation equipments, monitoring devices, um, the entire labor floor staff should be trained in handling these things. So this is an absolute basic thing when, uh, you know, when you palpate how and where, which level to get the epidural into. So during palpation, you, uh, the highest point of iliac thrust, we all know process the body of L4 or L4, L5 interspace in uh, uh, non-parturians. In parturients, it is slightly different because of the forward rotation of pelvis. It crosses at a little higher level. It is at L3, L4. So coming to positioning, as you can see here, there is exaggerated lumbar lordosis uh, in the parturients. Uh, most of the anesthetists prefer sitting position to place an epidural, uh, whereas some prefer lateral position. So when you position the patient, it is 
very important that the patient's legs should not be hanging. Their feet should be resting on a stool, which can be adjusted the height because the knees should be at a 90 degrees angle from the table. Now, the thing, as you can see in the picture on the image on the uh, lower side, uh, it is a good idea to have either a nurse or, a, or the husband, we allow the husbands also, to just relax the patient's shoulders so that she can, she's comfortable and uh, she can slouch uh, because there's a big tummy in the front. So it's difficult to give an ideal position. Now, this is uh, something in lateral position. We try to do similar things where the basically the mother has to slouch here. She's resting her head on the pillow and bending her knees. Okay, so now why do we always say that uh, the labor epidurals are more challenging? Uh, that's because the ligamentum flavum is uh, soft uh, because of the effect of progesterone. So loss of resistance is poorly uh, felt. Then there is because of increase in weight and edema in the back, especially in the in PIH patient, it makes um, identifying the intervertebral spaces very difficult. Then there is compromised positioning because of lumbar lordosis. And if the patient has got active contraction uh, and you have, an, you have your needle in place, please do not put it in, do not push it in because during an active contraction, the epidural space literally flattens. And even, a, even if you go in by two or three millimeters, you can actually puncture the dura. So in a patient who is in active labor, you have very small window to work and place the epidural. So a few contraindications of epidural are um, patient refusal, active maternal hemorrhage because the patient may come in hypotension, then septicemia, infection at or near the site of needle insertion. And if the patient has got clinical signs of coagulopathy, as in eclampsia, HELP syndrome, or nowadays we are also seeing patients with dengue um, who are coming with the very low platelets. So uh, this is a very interesting question, which uh, most of the fresh anesthetists who are coming into practice would have in their mind. And if they're starting, uh, you know, obstetric anesthesia is what is the exact time of initiation of epidural for labor? Now, the exact time actually is the maternal request is the time. If the mother requests, and th so that means that is the time to put an epidural irrespective of the um, cervical dilatation. However, there are a lot of interpersonal differences and that is based on a lot of other criteria such as if you are working alone or if you're working in team, you're working in a department. Um, if you're freelancing, you're working um, in a small nursing home, a bigger nursing home, it depends on the infrastructure. So you have to tailor and decide uh, with your obstetrician um, as to how you can manage because labor is a long process. It's not a one or two hours job. Um, Cochrane review and systematic reviews in the literature have shown that early or late initiation of epidural have similar effects on rate of cesarean deliveries. Okay, now uh, pregnancy of nine months builds a lot of anxiety and fear of needles uh, in uh, a laboring uh, woman. Now, a parturient in active labor is one such condition wherein she may neither register nor recall the side effects explained. So it's wise and medical legally uh, advisable to see them antenatally, either in the late second trimester or early third trimester. Now, this will provide enough time for us as anesthetist and patient to calmly and patiently understand about the epidural and the risks and complications involved. It has been observed that antenatal education not only increases maternal satisfaction, but also reduces the pain scores. And obviously, if the if the there are a fear of unknown goes away, if the patient knows uh, what exactly she will face when she's in labor. So uh, they, these are the brochures, uh, one on the left, which uh, we give it to our laboring mothers when they come or when we see them antenatally, we hand it over to them. It has details of the different options, the risks, benefits in length it is explained and they have enough time to uh, read it. So uh, they will remember, retain, and recall the complications. Unlike when you tell this to them in active labor, they don't have any recall. They just want uh, the pain relief to be given without knowing the complications. And later we face the consequences. So as I said, informed written consent is very important. And information has to be given to the mother, not to the mother's mother or the mother-in-laws or the, or the husband. It's the mother who should understand 
and we have to explain in the in the language that she best understands now uh, so i'm just coming to something called as infographics uh, like we have brochures here in our hospital you have to hurry up shilpa okay Mm -hmm. um, I'm extremely thankful to Dr. Ketan Parekh because uh, and Dr. Sunil Pandya who have actually uh, actively involved and made these infographics, which is a very complete and a crisp information, which is easy to read and understand. It talks about something like common side effects, which is one in 10, like itching, shivering, drop in blood pressure, then uncommon ones, which is about one in 100 where uh, something like epidural is not working properly or mild or too severe headache and the rare and the very rare ones which is one in 10,000 or one in 100,000 um, something like we hardly see like meningitis or unconsciousness or complete paralysis so this is again some common side effects and some uncommon side effects, which you can explain, like itching and shivering are mild and self-limiting. Uh, mild numbness will be temporary and reversible. Again, when the patient asks, how long will I take? You have to be patient and tell the procedure time would take 20 minutes. The medication will take 20 minutes to act because you have to go slow. And about in 40, 50 minutes, you'll be more comfortable. And we should always be happy to answer all their questions uh, before we do the procedure or even when we are doing the procedure, uh, we should be happy to answer all their questions. Now, because labor is a long process and it's a dynamic process, anything can go wrong, but we must be prepared for all the possibilities. And uh, the most satisfying thing for an obstetric anesthetist is a conscious and a pain-free mother. Thank you so much. And sorry for that glitch. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Shilpa. And... Um... We'll take the questions at the end if the time uh, permits us. Um, okay, so our next speaker will be uh, Professor Kajal Jain. Uh, she uh, is um, she doesn't need too much uh, introduction, but she is the uh, professor at Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care at PGI Chandigarh. So she's our secretary of AOA India. She has more than hundred publications, and she has been very very active in the AOA. Uh, to uh, have multiple uh, teaching sessions. So she will be today speaking on uh, labor epidural analgesia regimens. Over to you, Kajal. Thank you, Shilpa. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll go ahead uh, with our next talk. So uh, after Shilpa has, uh, you know, given us an elaborate view on how the mother should be prepared for ep labor epidurals, we also now need to know how to maintain this epidural catheter because uh, this epidural catheter is dealt with differently than the other catheters for surgical anesthesia. Here we are targeting that mothers should get only sensory block and they should be able to participate in the birthing process. We should not take away their motor power. They should be able to sit up. They should be able to pass urine. And with all this, they should not increase the clinician's workload also. So this all amounts, if you are able to give all this with the catheter, that amounts to good patient satisfaction, that is mother satisfaction, and, uh, a, and also a good clinical outcome in the sense the mother undergoes less of assisted vaginal deliveries, and so your obstetrician is also very happy. So therefore, we need to understand how we have to use this catheter as the mother progresses from her uh, different stages of labor. So... We have to, first and foremost, we must understand that we need to, once we put the catheter, we have to induce the catheter, which is also called loading the catheter. And then we have to maintain. And these two things interchangeably have to be in a steady state. Like you can't load and keep on waiting for the woman to complain and then you start your maintenance. You have to ensure that while the drug is acting, you, you top it up with another, uh, your top up so that she always gets those... Um, Pay that, that sensory level of analgesia. And we will see how we have to go about it uh, through our slides. So basically the technique of induction for loading depends and also the drugs and the drug delivery system. There are three things we are going to talk about today. If you talk about technique, we all know that we, we can do an epidural. In epidural, we have some extensions like uh, dural puncture epidural and combined spinal epidural. And then there's a single shot spinal also, which comes as a technique for labor analgesia. So when we talk of, about epidural technique, we all are very well aware of what happens 
we cro cross the subcutaneous and then ligamentum flavum and we place the catheter in the um, epidural space and we you know use this for medication and that's how it works but when we talk about cse cse just uh, crosses your epidural uh, with a to his needle and then you go to the same space and hit the subarachnoid space and deposit certain amount of drug in the spinal space leave the catheter in the epidural space and come out so that is csc technique and the latest one, and the common indications for doing a combined spinal epidural would be if you want to achieve rapid analgesia in the late first stage or early second stage or your there is a multi para who is already in established labor patient has a difficult back or patient has had a bad experience last time and you don't want to you know her to have uh, low confidence in you so you want to win her over by giving a quick shot of uh, labor and labor analgesia or the mother is too distressed and she is not allowing you to do the procedure e easily so if we talk about whether csc is good uh, vis a vis labor epidural analgesia csc gives a very quick onset of analgesia say in 3 to 5 minutes and it lasts up to 30 minutes so this analgesia is not only quick but it is also superior because it uh, gives a, a complete analgesia including the sacral analgesia there is less requirement of supplemental epidural boluses and fewer epidural catheter failures so the the maternal satisfaction associated with this quoted to be high when we talk about csc it also gives us the option of a concept called walking epidural but by walking we don't mean like walking like how this lady is walking it just means that the mother is able to ambulate in bed and uh, she can uh, you know walk till the washroom assisted so by maintaining the upright posture the weight of the fetus helps in cervical dilatation so this concept is good uh, in this way so what are the bad points of doing csc versus uh, labor epidural analgesia it is associated with fetal bradycardia and fetal bradycardia is uh, because there is a different there is a imbalance between the norepinephrine and epinephrine levels and norepinephrine happens to cause you know uh, uterine tetany so patient, the baby is stressed in a tetanic uh, uterus so that is why there is a chance of fetal bradycardia along with that the fentanyl which is injected inside can cause pruritus and the spinal component of bupivacaine can can cause hypotension also there is a possibility of the untested epidural catheter since you have already given the drug into subarachnoid space this catheter goes untested and some of the risks are theoretical like cns infection neurological complication and whether the incidence of pdph is increased there is no in increased incidence of pdph in these patients so this is one graph which shows like how the epidural and csc they change the epinephrine levels so we see with csc there's a drastic drop in norepinephrine levels because it gives very good analgesia in no time in no time so that results in imbalance so when we talk about uh, dural puncture epidural technique this is a relatively new technique introduced about 5 years back here what happens is that you uh, you reach the epidural space and then you puncture the subarachnoid space uh, you your uh, arachnoid matter but you do not inject any drug you inject the drug only in epidural and the concept is that through this hole which has been created the there is transmigration of local anesthetic into the spinal space and it it gives superior analgesia so with this concept in mind we have had some studies Uh, the first one came by this author uh, the group chow et al and they there was accompanied by an editorial a whole, whole lot better that means if you create a small hole it allows for the transmigration of the drug and pro provides superior analgesia so this after this randomized control trial showed us that dpe gives rapid onset of analgesia there are decreased chances of asymmetrical block and it provides good bilateral sacral block with fewer maternal and neonatal side effects having said that uh, this technique has been also shown to be less uh, you know the time to achieving pain relief was however the best with csc technique like in 2 minutes you are achieve able to achieve analgesia if you do a csc vis a vis dpe in which it takes about 11 minutes to achieve uh, significant pain relief with lumbar epidural 
you take 18 minutes to achieve pain relief. So I must say that it's very important that a woman who's having excruciating pain be relieved of pain as, for, as soon as possible. So with, however, with GPE, fewer patients needed physician top-ups, like only 22.5%, vis a -vis 50 in lumbar epidural and 50 in CSE. CSE lasts for a short time, as we had already discussed. After 30 minutes, you need to top it up. So this is another downside of the other two techniques. With DPE, patients experience fewer side effects like itching, hypotension, and asymmetrical block. So like DPE is, is trumping over the other two techniques um, through this study we have come to know. So has spinal analgesia got any role? Some of us are in uh, extreme uh, places, like remote places where we do not have access or we haven't done anything. So I must tell you, there are certain centers like in, in, uh, in Indonesia and in South Africa, where people have administered spinal analgesia to relieve women of excruciating pain. And they have used 22.5 milligram of bupivacaine with fentanyl 25 mics. They have, in this study, the authors also utilized 0.2 milligrams of morphine. However, uh, this was associated with significant side effects attributable to intrathecal morphine. But if you have a woman with you who's in excruciating pain, you do not have access to anything it may be good, uh, good to use 2.5 milligram bupivacaine with 25 microgram fentanyl. People are even repeating after four hours of this, uh, the same spinal analgesia with low dose. So coming down to the drugs, when we talk about drugs, uh, we have to know that now uh, we, were, we started with high concentration and low volumes in earlier days, like we were using 0 0.5, 0 0.375 or 0.25. But now there is evidence to suggest that go low on concentration, but high on volume. The concentrations have dropped down to as low as 0.06 to 5% or 0.1 to 0.125%. And this has been shown to be associated with greater efficacy, fewer side effects and better outcomes. This is because they have seen through cadaveric dissections, they have seen that there's a uniform spread of liquid in the epidural space through intervertebral foramen and along the nerve sheets when you use large volumes of injectates at higher injected pressures. So don't be scared that if you are using 20 ml, my patient will get a high level. It has been shown that the volume extension in a horizontal direction happens for only about four dermatomes. More important is a circumferential spread, which we talked about in the first slide. If you give a circumferential spread, the effects are much better. So if you do large volumes, you are able to achieve this. If you talk about drugs, the drugs used are bupivacaine, ropivacaine, and luvopupivacaine. You can choose any. And the opioids, uh, in our country, we are using fentanyl and bupivacaine combination in low doses. So is ropivacaine a better option? So there were five, 11 studies uh, in five years where, this, where they reported that pain scores, motor block, maternal satisfaction as outcome measures, and both the drugs were well suited for the, this. However, motor block was both was more with bupivacaine. But we must understand that if we are using a patient-controlled uh, epidural analgesia pump, the flexibility may offset any such advantage. That is, the motor block may be negated if you use lower volumes, lower doses of bupivacaine. This is one uh, meta-analysis uh, which uh, took care of 11 RCTs with approximately 1,997 parturients. And they saw the effect of low concentration versus high concentrations. They opined that if you use uh, lower concentrations, you, there is reduced incidence of assisted vaginal delivery, shorter second stage of labor with fewer motor blocks and less urinary retention. And even neonatal outcomes are favorable. So here comes the role of low concentrations. These are some regimens which have been given by none other than our uh, Dr. Sunanda Gupta. She has el el elaborately informed us about what is the initial dose we should use. And if we are setting it up with the patient controlled epidural analgesia, what is the low dose mixture we should be going ahead with? If we are doing a, a combined spinal epidural, what should be the intrathecal dose? So basically, if we talk about uh, uh, combined spinal epidural, you can use 1.75 to 2.5 milligrams and add about 15 to 20 mics. Then you can top it up about 30 minutes later with 10 to 15 ml with a low dose mixture. 
And then if you want to connect your patient to a pump, it can be a five to ml pump and that's how it goes on. So if you're using ropivacaine, then the concentrations are 0.08 to 0.2%. If you're using levobupivacaine, the concentrations are 0.05% to 0.125%. This article is available in our Indian Journal of Anesthesia, easily accessible to all. So now talking about maintenance of how we will maintain this, we know the doses, we know the technique, how are we going to maintain? So earlier on the protocols for labor epidural analgesia started with intermittent uh, boluses, like uh, the clinician had to go and give, and then we graduated to continuous epidural analgesia. Then along the time course, uh, patient controlled epidural analgesia pumps came into existence. Now, however, we have smart pumps available to us, which are like called programmed intermittent epidural uh, pumps. So there's a, you can combine patient control with continuous epidural, or you can co combine programmable pumps with patient control and a background infusion. It all depends on the availability. And let's see what the literature evidence says. So if we give intermittent uh, epidural boluses, the, the workload is increased. There are drug errors which can happen. Sterility is an issue. You delay the analgesia because if you are held up, you will go only once the woman is screaming back in pain. And you have to rely on the attendants, uh, whether like the patient is requiring epidural analgesia or no, because patient doesn't cooperate at time. If you give continuous epidural analgesia, you, it goes on at the same rate. There is no change for interpatient variability. Intens whether it's at any intensity of pain, you're not able to change. It continues at a slow pace at all stages of labor. Hence, it doesn't give uh, any control over analgesia and your mother is extremely dissatisfied. So these two techniques are not really very good. So if we see the randomized controlled trials, a meta-analysis considering of a very large number of patients, say about 2,573, they have shown that it intermittent bolus technique, if you use, should be used only with pumps. If you use with pumps, that may be associated with fewer anesthetic interventions and lower consumptions. So I'll show you why this happens. Why intermittent boluses, if given through pumps, not through manual, are better. Because when you give intermittent boluses, the spread is far better because of the high pressure injectates which you give when you push the drug through. So more the pressure, more the uh, exit of the drug from the multi orifice catheter and more the spread. However, if you give continuous, uh, slow continuous infusion, so this, cause, this uh, causes the drug to exit almost exclusively from the proximal hole and there is limited spread. So we would, we, with bolus technology, you go like, you know, circumferentially and higher up. Whereas with infusion, there is not a good circumferential spread and see the way the, the, the drug concentrations go low. So this is irregular spread and it doesn't give a happy, happy analgesia to the mother. So, and program intermittent boluses are the new things in. So with program intermittent, intermittent epidural boluses, we mean that you give a fixed bolus at scheduled intervals, and they are good alternatives to CEI or as background administrator with patient controlled analgesia technique. This technique is coming into practice again because of the same reason, because it gives a circumferential spread rather than you know depositing local anesthetic at one point only. So there are many regimes. You can start with these regimes, but the thing to remember is that time from starting the pump to first PIEB bolus should be 30 to 60 minutes. You should start within that and you should give a program bolus, which should be a good volume, like 10 ml. You should time it like between 45 to 60 minutes. And then you can also give the option if you have a smart pump that the patient can also take five to 10 ml in an, in an hour. Uh, and then you should set up, uh, sorry, five to 10 ml in 10 to 15 minutes as a lockout interval. So this is how you, you know, this is one regime which you can follow. By doing such regimes, People have given us that the doses of bupivacaine had actually decreased if you do this intermittent policies. This was given in 2006. And then we also were told by this study by an, the same author, Wong et al., that if you do a 10 ml bolus in 60 minutes, that gives a better maternal satisfaction with decreased bupivacaine cons consumption. And in this study, authors also recorded a very low incidence of motor block if you do this programmable intermittent boluses. These are some smart pumps which uh, are available. This is like uh, uh, 
this is a cat cat solace this is by i think uh, smith's guy so this is available in india also so this pumps and this these are programmable pumps which are like computer enabled so they give even pre more precise control this pump uh, was specifically these smart pumps they are uh, they are labor they suit the labor pain, pain dynamics and they are multifactorial in nature and uh, they they can be you know altered according to the changing needs of labor analgesia and the patient satisfaction is enhanced so this is one computer integrated uh, pump which one of our um, uh, authors have used so they have adjusted the requirement of the patient based on patient's consumption over the last one hour this uh, author is uh, dr alexia he is a very well known person who has brought this computerized pump for us and he has also told us that if you use this pump there is a reduction in the need for anesthetic administered supplementation and uh, this uh, not only increases maternal satisfaction but also decreases the workload of the clinician so if i sum it up i will not talk about the troubleshoots because dr ketan is going to talk about it i'll just say if you are maintaining labor analgesia use a low dose with a fentanyl uh, with an opioid mixture give a large bolus give a long interval and give the first dose soon after the loading dose that is about 40 minutes later do have the option of given a given a giving my mother an autonomy to control her own pain by using patient controlled epidural analgesia bolus about 5 ml set at 10 minutes lock up you can go to a large volume about 30 ml so you should not worry about the max volume because it's like about 30 ml so boluses are good but try to use them uh, through the pumps so programmable pumps with patient controlled epidural analgesia is superior to continuous with patient controlled you should standardize your technique establish clear outcomes assess your epidurals frequently and you remember that all, one regimen may not fit all women so you have to be very vigilant about the progress of labor thank you very much thank you so much dr kajal that was a, a very elaborate uh, uh, talk and very beautifully explained our uh, final uh, talk the last and the most interesting one is um, with uh, dr ketan parekh uh, he is a practicing consultant obstetric anesthesiologist uh, for last 25 years in the city of mumbai at bridge county hospital uh, he is uh, also the founder president of aoa mumbai uh, he has uh, uh been scientific chairperson for many uh, national uh, conferences obstetric conferences uh, he has authored many chapters in the books uh, he is also co-editor uh, with the world clinics um, anesthesia and analgesia for labor and delivery it was a special edition uh, his uh, latest uh, creation is infographics uh, which i just mentioned in my talk a little bit of it but you can get the details of it at our website www.india.in uh, his special interest is epidural analgesia for painless labor uh, i would also request all of you to please put your questions in the chat box if you have any the question answer session will be uh, addressed uh, after his talk for about 15 20 minutes so you can start putting your questions if you have any in the chat box and they will be answered Uh, over to you, Dr. Ketan Parekh. Uh, pitfalls and troubleshooting in labor analgesia. There is nothing more satisfying than giving a newborn in the arms of a smiling mother. We obstetric anesthesiologists are blessed to be enjoying this gratification. However. not all epidurals are a happy story 84 to 86% of the epidurals will work on the first go and will be working satisfactorily however 12 to 14% of epidurals may need some kind of a management or manipulation in order to make them work 5 to 6% of these epidurals may need man catheter management in terms of catheter pulling out or adjustment of the catheters however there are 7 to 8% of the epidurals which may need reciting so by and large with whatever management one does 
about 98 to 99% of the APD should fall into a satisfactory range and make the patients comfortable. However, it is important to remember that there are one to two percent of the epidurals which will not work and it is important to remember and accept failure and recourse to other modes of pain relief so it is important to know that there are epidurals which may not work the royal college of anesthetists also proposed the target having said that effective analgesia after placing an epidural within 45 minutes should be established in more than 88 percent of the parturients 98% of mothers should be satisfied with their epidural pain relief on your follow up rounds and your epidural recite or manipulation rate should be less than 15%. So why do epidural fail? Now there are a list of reasons why the epidurals fail which is not the kind of uh, points to discuss in this talk. So I will focus more on management but Important thing is that once my epidural fails or if my epidural doesn't work, I will certainly do an introspection and try to realize what have I done wrong or what can I do differently to make my epidurals work next time and to minimize the failure rate or to improve my success rate. The few points that you must keep in mind is a poor identification of the epidural space, suboptimal catheter placement, subsequent catheter migration inadequate dose or more volume of analgesic medicines and improper management of this the volume is a very very important uh, point and you i want to just highlight that that it is very important to use larger volume a lot of time people tell me that sir i've given 5 ml of 0.5 percent bpvacan and there's partial pain relief now that 5 ml instead of that 5 ml you could have given that same 0.5 percent directed and given a 12 ml and you would have a better pain relief because we want to do only the sensory block and the sensory or the pain part is carried by a delta and c fibers and these are most sensitive fibers and they just don't need much penetration when you're talking about motor block which is by a alpha you need higher concentration because they're less sensitive and you need to penetrate those fibers to block the motor fibers however sensory fibers don't need that and you need more volume and low concentration. So that's something that one has to be very, very clear in their mind. My normal dose is about 12 to 15 ml of 0.1% bupivacaine with 2 microgram of fentanyl, which I divide into 3 equal dose of 5 ml and give it over a period of 10 minutes, making sure that every dose is considered as a test dose and we're giving it slowly and incrementally. So when epidural fails, everyone should have a plan now this is my flow chart when my epidural fails this is how i follow the flow chart in my mind and i can try to manage i know it's looking a little complicated i'm going to dissect it into small parts but what i'm trying to ascertain here is everybody should have their flow chart or a plan in mind now starting with my plan how will i proceed once i've given an epidural i will wait for 20 minutes after giving my full dose and then assess the patient for pain relief. If the patient is happy with the pain relief, then we are okay and we don't need to worry about and just kind of be comfortable. However, if the patient is not happy, I will assess the amount of pain relief or the situation and find out whether there is any partial pain relief or there is no pain relief at all. Now, if there is no pain relief or if there's partial pain relief and patient is not very happy at the end of 20 minutes, something that comes to my mind that will this epidural need something being done and what needs to be done is 3R. You will have to revive this epidural, you might have to recite this epidural or you might have to recourse to some other mode of pain relief. So this something comes at the back of my mind but I'm going to still not think much on that and I'm going to progress with my management power. However, at this stage, I would be happy to understand that 85% of my epidurals will fall into this happy group and I will not have to do anything at all. If there is no pain relief at all after 20 minutes of my original dose, I would repeat my dose or I would give half the caesarean dose. That's about say 10 ml of 0.25% bupivacaine or maybe sometimes 0.5% bupivacaine. Establishing that if there is a motor block, then my catheter is in place. So I will look for motor block after giving a caesarean dose. So I will repeat my dose after 20 minutes and 
then assess the patient at the end of 20 minutes. If the patient is satisfactorily or happy with the pain relief, then that's fine. But if the patient is not happy, I will check the level of pain relief. If it is good motor block with partial pain relief, I will discuss about that situation a little later. But if there's minimal pain relief or there's no pain relief at all, it is the time for me to accept the failure. And I will say that, yes, this epidural is not going to work. I need to remove this catheter and either recite or think of the other option. The reason I am saying that at this stage, it is very, very important to accept failure is number one, you're already approaching that 45 minutes guideline by the Royal College of Anesthetists, and you already wasted 45 minutes in establishing pain relief and you've not achieved anything. So better remove the catheter and recite it to do something better. Or my main concern is there is very typical situation where your catheter is partially intravascular, where you may have minimal pain relief, no pain relief, minimal pain relief, no pain relief, and you keep giving more and more. And at the end of the hour, you might end up with a local anesthetic toxicity. Or if the catheter is subdural, suddenly at some stage by giving lots and lots of volume, you might, you might have you know, uh, disturb the balance and your arachnoid membrane will then get punctured and you may have a total or a high spinal. So it is very, very important to accept failure at this stage and not to worry about continuing to, you know, manage this catheter and think of reciting or recourse to the other option. So now, now let's come to this part of partial pain relief with your epidural. And it's this 12 to 14 percent of your epidural that will fall into this group and this is where we need to kind of focus more on how we're going to do and i have a three-step three-step management to revive this epidural either by, uh, by assessment and management of your epidural so what are you going to assess i've just kept a compass here just to kind of give you a little visual thing that you will assess north south east west that means you will assess the height of the block you will see both the sides. Is it left side working, right side working? Is it numb perineum? But patient is complaining of pain, but there's, the perineum is completely numb. Or the sacral sparing, where the height of the block is very good, but patient is complaining of pain in the bottom area. Or there are patchy blocks, mid segments. So you need to assess the quality of your block. And also you need to assess the four P's. That's the position of the fetal head. Is it occipital posterior? Has the progress of the labor been very fast and suddenly the patient has become fully dilated? Is there a possibility of uterine hyperstimulation or hypotonicity? Or there is a possibility of a full bladder or a scar dehiscence. So the obstetric assessment also is important. So it's important to assess your block as well as assess the patient from the obstetric point of view. Once you've assessed the patient with this thing, then you try to man manage the uh, failure. And again, my management options are four M's. That's either I'll use more volume or more concentration or I'll manipulate the catheter. And the last thing, which is a little controversial, is that move the patient, that is, use the gravity. I know the, the book says that, that there's no gravity in epidural space and uh, gravity doesn't make sense, but I'm sure all obstetric anesthetists who work with labor analgesia would say and would agree that when you have a unilateral block, if you can turn the patient on the side where the block is not working, it certainly gives uh, a good block or in second stage we do give blocks sitting the patients up and it works so yes i will put, still put that as a fourth uh, management point the question is whether you will give more volume or you will manipulate the catheter first now there's a very good study where they had 78 patients with uh, inadequate analgesia and they made the plan that either they, they had a two-step approach in the group one or on the group A, they gave extra volume first. And if that didn't work, then they pulled out the catheter and then they gave extra volume again. In plan B, they pulled out the catheter first, gave extra volume, and if that didn't work, they gave extra volume again. So what they found was 75% of the time, whether you give only local anesthetics or you pulled out and gave local anesthetics, 75% of the time, you manage to salvage the block. And if that didn't work, when you went for your step, step two, you had 100% success rate. So my point is, 
75% of the time you will be successful if you just do either of the first step. And in my practice, I would rather give local anesthetic volume first than pulling out because practically pulling out the catheter is not as easy as just giving an extra volume. So I would give extra volume first, depending on the uh, type of the block. And then if that still doesn't work, I will put out, pull out the catheter by a millimeter, by a centimeter or so, and then give more volume. If after doing all these things again, if the pain relief is not adequate, patients are not comfortable, I will certainly accept this as a failure and follow my last option and that is reciting of the epidural or recourse to other forms of analgesia. So what are the recite options? And when do I recite? Reciting will depend on the stage and progress of the labor. It will also depend on difficulty in citing the epidural on the first attempt. Whether the patient will consent for it, because by the time 45 minutes, one hour has passed and some of the patients will say, no, I do not want to do anything. Please leave me alone. And obstetric assessment, is there a possibility of a cesarean section? Is there a possibility? In that case, you must make sure that you provide good analgesia to these patients so that when the actual delivery happens, they are not in uh, extreme pain. So th these factors will kind of help you to decide whether you need to recite. What are the options? Somebody will just plain put another epidural. I personally would put a combined spinal epidural in this situation because of the obvious advantages of combined spinal epidural over the uh, simple epidural. There is also a talk about dural puncture epidural being slightly better than epidural and uh, one may think of that as an option but there are still lots of uh, question marks about its efficacy so I don't do that but it just kept there as a number one of the uh, as one of the options or if the if, if the labor is progressing very rapidly it's a multi gravida you may just give a single shot spinal as a, a mode of labor analgesia and get on with it so your options are there but you need to decide which options to take depending on the clinical situation or you may recourse to entonox again which may be a little issue in this covid situation but entonox i have used very successfully at times and it can be a good option we do not have remifentanil so IV opioids is not a major option for us, but sometimes yes, a 25 micrograms, uh, 25 micrograms of bolus of fentanyl may tide over the situation. The obstetricians can give a local block, or you might use intradermal saline uh, for uh, taking care of especially the pain of the occipital posterior, which gives a typical back pain and uh, causes discomfort, even though the apple is working perfectly all right otherwise. Now. A situation where you've been kind of doing an epidural patient has been very comfortable for two three hours and when you give a third top up it doesn't work there could be a rapidly progressive labor occipital posterior i've already said patient might have reached the second stage of labor and is complaining of pressure instead of pain or there may be a full bladder the situation in this case is you have to use sometime higher concentration and higher volume to get rid of this excessive demand or the other or worrisome option is that catheter might have migrated so you have to assess the catheter look at this uh, catheter fixation site and make sure that there is no leakage of the local anesthetics uh, the gauze is not wet or the, the mark where you kept the catheter and fix is the same because catheters can migrate outward and inward outward if they migrate into tissues it will be just a wastage of the local anesthetics and will not give you any analgesia. However, the concern is if it's an inward migration and if you keep giving more and more, as I said earlier also, you may end up with intramuscular or subdural block. So you have to assess the catheter before you give extra dose if a working epidural catheter fails. Now, why is it important to identify this failure earlier? If you do not identify this, if this patient ends up with a cesarean section, you might have a problem because some epidurals can get you through to the labor, but they will not work for your cesarean sections. And which are the kind of red hearings or the early warning sign is frequent breakthrough pains, higher number of top-ups than your normal top-ups, inadequate pain relief, higher BMI, 
higher gestational age, high vas during labor, and younger or maternal age. But however, the first three are important from our point of view at this moment that if you have a frequent breakthrough pain, multiple top ups, and inadequate pain relief, which patient is saying, okay, I can manage, these are the epidurals that will probably fail when you have to do a cesarean under the same epidural. So you have to be better be alarmed. And again, assessing the situation, you may want to recite those epidurals so that you don't end up in a mess on the operation theater. This is what I call iatrogenic failure, not giving those in the second stage of labor. There are a lot of people who are rather a lot of obstetricians who would advise not to give those once the patients are fully dilated because they think that the patient is not going to push or they might have to use instruments. It is not acceptable. Actually, you know, these are various stories I, I get sometimes of patients who have not delivered with us earlier. They come that I had an excellent painless labor, but the delivery was extremely painful. You must understand that the delivery pain is more intense than the labor pain. The nerve roots are far away from your epidural tip. The sacral nerves are thicker and are larger in diameter, so they need more volume and more concentration to penetrate. And hence, it is extremely important that do not stop or withhold analgesia during second stage. Okay, so avoid this iatrogenic failure for sure. Now, I just want to quote this one patient of mine who was second gravida. I gave her an epidural and uh, it was obviously not working well and she was very uncomfortable. So we, I did my extra dose and by the time, you know, 30, 35, 40 minutes had passed and she was not very happy. So I was almost thinking of reciting when the obstetrician checked her and she was fully dilated. So I just managed her with Entonox and IV fluid. I, I mean, I have a little bit of fentanyl and all. And next day on my post uh, delivery round, when I went to see her, I was expecting her to shout at me and, you know, give her complaints. However, when I went there, I was surprised to, you know, receive this uh, little small bouquet and she was very happy and she said, thank you very much, doc, and all that. Along with this, she'd get a card and the card said, your gentle words were even better than the pain relief. What I'm trying to say here is communication is very important. Even though your pain relief is not adequate, you must speak, you give positive affirmation, be in constant touch and communication with the patient. You give them the reasoning for the discomfort. I kept on telling her the reason you're feeling a pain is probably, you know, you reach full dilatation, your baby's head is pushing down, some kind of an explanation. And whatever you do, give explanation for your action. So it should look like that you are doing something for them. It's not that you just don't know what's going on. And, you know, be apologetic. Sorry, I am not able to solve your problem. I'm trying my best. And most important thing in that situation like this, you also must always follow up these patients, talk to them, give them the explanation and make a proper documentation just in case it was to lead to any medical legal issues later on. Okay. So just to summarize, correctly placed epidurals also may have inappropriate spread and inadequate analgesia. Normal epidural spread does not guarantee adequate analgesia. 8% of good spread will give you poor analgesia. 42% of good analgesia had non-uniform spread. This is a fantastic study and it just says it all. You don't know which epidural is going to work. You do your best and hope that you fall into that 84, 85%. If not, the remaining 10, 12% you will manage and be into that 98%. Yet be prepared that there will be an epidural failure. However, with your attitude and all, all you have to say is that you should try and do your best to comfort these ladies who are in extreme pain and do your best. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Ketan Parikh. It was an excellent uh, talk and very, very beautifully explained the pitfalls and troubleshooting. I'm sure um, the anesthetists who are attending this particular... Uh, I'm sure the anesthetists who are uh, who have attended this will uh, be able to troubleshoot in a much better way now. Uh, we are actually ready to take some questions uh, if we have Debelina. Uh, before we take, uh, so I have a few questions already here. Uh, Kajal, the question is for you. Uh, like I think this is from somebody who is working in a teaching hospital. Um, so they the question is that. What kind of anesthesia regimen uh, can be used 
in a teaching hospital where the infrastructure uh, in the sense you don't have one is to one or one is to two uh, ratio of the nursing staff to look after the patients who have taken the epidural. So what do you do for patient safety in such a scenario? So I think you're asking me two questions in one. Mm -hmm. so the first one yes. is uh, what, and see, uh, recently we did one uh, labor analgesia webinar um, on AOA platform. And in that we conducted a survey also in which uh, we had uh, out of 500 people, 300 responded. And we, we realized that most of us are doing um, boluses, but those boluses are uh, intermittent boluses. They are not through the pumps because most of the places pumps are not available. But I, in my slides, I had I had shown one Smith's, uh, you know, cord solace pump, cat solace pump that is available and that gives like uh, intermittent boluses. We have one PIB available in India, but the cost and the cost of running that cassette may be too high. So I would say those of us who do not have, um, you know, this facility can still uh, practice doing intermittent boluses. So uh, is, does it sort of solve your uh, question? Uh, no, yes. So whatever, what about uh, Dr. Jayashree? So we are also in a hospital where there is a large volume of patients. So how do you handle if there are too many patients asking for labor analysis here? We as of now, we are not that lucky that too many patients ask us. Oh, you asked me that question? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, occasionally there are two at a time, but not really so many as I told you. Uh, we uh, somehow in North Delhi, uh, they are in, uh, they're not still very pro labor epidural, uh, pro. So, that way we don't have a great rush, but we have. We've had instances where few patients want at the same time, but we have uh, enough staff, Shilpa, and mm -hmm. so really it doesn't uh, bother us much. We have staff in the sense my anesthesiologists are obstetric anesthesiologists, and we have four pain nurses, so they help us when the obstetric uh, labor analgesia has to be given epidurals. They come and although they are in general in the pain. Uh, they are pain nurses, but they come and, you know, stand with the patient. And because you know how the labor room is, the labor room nurses are always busy. So we have this uh, uh, provision where we can give two at a time, but we've never had a, uh, this thing, a case where we, you know, need to have three at a time or something like that. But I'm and, and where do you, uh, Kajal, uh, where uh, do you actually administer the epidural? Like, where do you put the epidural? Do you have a separate? In my uh, hospital, we are, uh, you know, um, uh, government hospital. We do all our epidurals in the theater. And we do not want too much of, uh, you know, uh, traffic inside uh, uh, where the general ward is there. It's like a very heavy traffic area. So we like to do it in um, operation theater with the OT scrubs. And okay. we, wear a, we, wear, mm -hmm. we wear a gown cap mask and then, then we do it. Shall and I then do you any questions now? Let us, I think we should, uh, there are so many questions suddenly they've popped up. Yeah. So, so uh, asked, uh, quickly, quickly. So what is the lowest dose for bupivacaine uh, that can be used effectively? Uh, do you want to, Dr. Ketan Pari, do you want to answer this? Well, yeah, the recommendation, the lowest is 0.0625% bupivacaine with two <laughs> mics of fentanyl. But uh, I personally feel that uh, for that, you need to really have good expertise and, uh, you know, very strict uh, monitoring and one-to-one uh, -one nursing. So I usually use 0.1% bupivacaine with two mics per ml of fentanyl. Uh, same yeah. goes for us. We also yeah, like same goes for me. I, okay. Okay, then uh, there is one question on how effective is Entonox in clinical practice? Um, whereas the eff effectivity is one question, the other is greenhouse effect. So um, we must be worried about both the, these things together. So in uh, our hospital, we are not using Entonox for the same reason. Uh, but uh, I'll ask Ketan if they're using, I think he mentioned in his... Yeah, I, I also, I don't kind of offer them as a choice because of the obvious uh, greenhouse effect that you said and uh, you know uh, effect on the pollution. But you see, it's the situation where you are called for an epidural to give a pain relief to somebody who's in pain, who's kind of, you know, shouting and screaming, and you don't have time for an epidural. 
this is the only quick option that you have which will give them some pain relief um, i tell uh, it is not as effective as epidural but it certainly is definitely a pain relief because it's a established pain relief across europe so i use quite effectively and uh, i get my feedback that yes definitely last 15 minutes were much better after the gas was started so yes it does work it is effective but uh, it is uh, not to be taken lightly and it is never given as a choice that patients don't come saying i want entonox but i had one french lady who had delivered in paris first time round and she used entonox for the entire delivery and she came here with 3 cm dilatation and said i want only entonox for next 2 hours and that we refused because that is not acceptable with our setup i am happy you said that ketan because the today one video was viral in which uh, it was being mentioned that uh, now laboring and giving birth is a cake walk and they had highlighted the role mm. of entonox so we want to tell the audience uh, to take it with a pinch of salt absolutely so, Uh, the question for me was that with quick pain relief can lead to fetal bradycardia so what is the safe lag period for pain relief i would say don't use fentanyl because we have ourselves conducted a study and we have seen that if you use only local anesthetic 2 uh, mg bevacin that's good enough to uh, induce um, labor analgesia and then you can you know start a pump uh, 30 minutes later so that would be the better answer can i, I just add on ha ah, yeah ketan aap bol sorry ma'am sorry madam yeah i mean more important than that it is the patience it is the obstetric uh, understanding that is required these are transient bradycardia these are not something there are enough studies to prove that these are transient bradycardia it doesn't actually cause any harm so if you watch the patient for 15 20 minutes it will settle down this is typical because of the hyper simulation for the graph that dr kajal has already shown that how the noradrenaline drops with the quick pain relief and it is just the hyper simulation which settles in 20 minutes and you don't need to rush for cesarean so it just Uh, education and awareness that is more important than worrying about changing your technique yes. we can also tell them to do a little bit of uh, intra uterine fetal resuscitation yeah absolutely that's absolutely that's what i'm saying so it's a, just a transient phase it's not really yeah. something that you need yeah. to worry about so we have to educate the obstetricians about this it's very important i agree with you completely don't let them enter in the labor room for 20 minutes after your epidural <laughs> What do you do if you have, if a small piece of epidural catheter is left inside during removal of a catheter? This is Doctor Abhijit Ingle. So I think we have received this question many times, Ketan. Ah, uh, see, there are two things. If the catheter is already dislodged and you've already broken the catheter inside, then the first and the foremost important thing is to inform the patient. You must take a documentation. take a written consent and inform the patient of what has happened then the next step is whether you want to access that catheter to remove it or leave it behind that depends on number 1 whether there are any neurological symptoms number 2 how near the catheter is to your uh, spinal cord and number 3 patient's comfort because if while pulling the catheter is very near the spinal cord irritating a nerve root causing discomfort here and there so symptomatic catheters if they are broken inside they need to be removed if they are asymptomatic away from spinal cord and if the patient is comfortable you can take mri give a documentation inform the patient and you can ignore and leave it away absolutely correct because but most important thing is documentation and uh, explaining the patient exactly what has happened rather than hiding and just letting the patient go away without knowing what is actually there in the back Uh, thank you ketan that is particularly uh, true because uh, epidural catheters are made of inert material if they are left anywhere in the subcutaneous plane or in the muscle plane we need to document and uh, if they are causing any neurological symptom they need to be evaluated with the help of a neurologist so uh, another so next is what if the mother is in severe pain and uncooperative for epidural so dr parekh what will you do <laughs> well i mean uh, it's it's just matter of communication exactly yeah. it's it's simply matter of communication they are not uncooperative because they don't want to cooperate with you they are uncooperative because the pain is killing them mm. so you know if you explain them if you communicate with them properly explain them what is required of them that next 15 20 minutes if you just cooperate things will be much much easier so communication is the most important thing second thing which i don't do it because it's not available in the delivery rooms where i mean in the in the labor rooms where we give the epidural but if suppose it's a multi pair and patient is already taken to the delivery room where i have an access to entonox you may want to give them the entonox to breathe while the 
April has been going on. But then, you know, sometimes you lose the com communication and the connectivity of the patient. If the patient becomes drowsy with the Entronox and then may suddenly move or not understand what is going on. So I'm not very, very comfortable doing anything like that. Some people would advise giving 25 mics of fentanyl IV. But, you know, all those things are not work. I have never had to have anything given for these patients in 25 years. And I've had enough patients who are uncooperative, not uncooperative in terms of not want to have the epidural, uncooperative because of the pain. And it's just a matter of communication, simply. Absolutely. I, I had one patient, I had one patient who was ticklish at this spot, F L2, L3. So the moment I would put my finger there, she's, even in labor, she would giggle and run away from the site. <laughs> so, you know, we've had challenges like that, but it's just simple communication and distraction technique that works. And uh, that takes care of this kind of issues. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Um, and how advisable is the presence of bystanders while performing an epidural? Do you allow one, two, three, or nobody in the room when you're doing an epidural? Well, I mean, it's not a movie that you allow the, every, the full audience. But I always say uh, the husband is an equal partner in crime. And uh, he should be allowed to the everything. So, yes, I always have the husband in the room when the appeal is being given. The advantages are, first of all, the patient don't feel left out. They are in pain till the moment you come to the room. Husband is the only known face, only comfort zone that they have. If you take away that comfort zone, then they become even more uncomfortable with the un unknown surrounding and unknown people with something going behind the back. So mm -hmm. husband having in front of the face is a big, big relief. One of my senior always said that, you know, people say, you know, you have unnecessary people in the room, you will inf uh, increase risk of infection. Uh, and he would always say the husband is not an unnecessary source of infection, but is a necessary source of inspiration. So wow. husband is somebody who's allowed, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't allow anybody else. Okay. And what other opioids have better pain relief other than fentanyl? None. So we use sufentanyl also, and um, I don't have sufentanyl. No. We don't have. We have most most of the studies no. are using fentanyl only. People are also using clonidine and uh, dexmedetomidine, but dexmedetomidine is not approved for intrathecal use. So in this platform, we would say fentanyl. So one very basic question by Bhargavi Vishwanath is how deep should the catheter be placed? Like if we get an axis of epidural at five centimeters, so you how much to Shilpa fix it? At? You, you, have, uh, you have put the epidural today. So we, I normally put it three to five centimeters in. And uh, one, uh, so that is what I do. Go about four to six. So at the, at the skin, I would keep it at 10 or 11 centimeters because when you change the position, there's always one centimeter which may just uh, slip out. Yeah. And the, another question, the tag on question to this is like, how does the migration of epidural catheter happen? Sometimes only one side or one leg has analgesia. I think Ketan has already shown this algorithm yeah. uh, on what to do if there is a one-sided analgesia. We have we uh, we have already discussed this. How? Yeah. So, what is the incidence of hypotension? Only thing. Sorry, one second. Only thing I want to add on to that question is how migration happens. Migration happens purely because of the movement. There are there are studies which have kind of looked into from sitting position to lying down position, from flex sitting to uh, straightening up, from left lateral flex to left lateral straightening up, all those movement plus during labor when the patients get contractions and become tightened, all those things can cause migration of the catheter. So just to answer that question, how the migration happens. Okay. Oh, perfect. That's, uh, I would agree with that. So next question by Shiv Prakash is, what is the incidence of hypotension that you normally see during epidural labor analgesia? Yeah? Uh, it's a very small dose of uh, bupivacaine which we normally give. And before that, we advocate that uh, a small fluid bolus be given. Yes. So the incidence mm -hmm. of hypertension is fairly low. And if at all it happens, you, you have to give fluid bolus followed by ephedrine or phenylephrine, whatever is available. More important is to keep the pressures uh, maintained and not to give hypotension. And the next Can I time just add on? Yeah. Yeah, as, as you both said, the incidence of hypertension is extremely low with the dose that we use. So two things. Number one, uh, as you said, 200, 300 ml of uh, ring electric should be given. There is no preloading required. So there should not be misunderstanding on the part of the audience that preloading is required before you start the epidural. 
So April, you can start, start the April process while the fluid is going on, number one. So you don't waste time. And number two, if hypotension happens, you have to be actually critical about your block and look at intradermal uh, or intrathecal uh, migration of the catheter and check for those reasons for the hypotension rather than the actual epidural. Because as you said, with the dose of epidural that we are using, hypotension is extremely, extremely uh, low. So just kind of a little red hearing if hypotension does occur. Dr. Indrani has also mentioned about, uh, hello, Dr. Indrani, I can't hear, see you or hear you, but hello. Baxter has come out with patient control disposable pumps. Yes, they have pumps. And when we conducted the survey, we also found that uh, out of our 350 responses, 6.5% people are using these elastomeric pumps um, because uh, not everybody has access to uh, infusion pumps. So yes, this is uh, being used by some people. So how do yeah, you direct the I mean, tip, uh, Ketan? Caudally or cephaloid? Always, always cephaloid. Never caudal. Same Never way. ever caudal because if, because if, if if people can understand the anatomy of epidural space, the intervertebral space, the thing runs downwards. So if you if you if you try to put your catheter caudally, you have higher chance of actually. Uh, leaving the intervertebral, intervertebral foramina and catheter lying outside the epidural space. So it's never, never caudal. Uh, we also tip it up only. We don't uh, tip it down. I don't know, uh, Dr. Fahad Mohammed. I hope this sorts out your query. And uh, there were good questions, good number of questions. And I think we can uh, now wind it up. Okay. Debelina? Uh, no, yes. All the questions have been answered, <laughs> but I'm sure there's so many questions in the mind of the people. Debelina, you want me to conclude and give the vote of thanks? Hello? Right. So uh, now that we finished with the question and answers, it's my duty to give the vote of thanks. And it's really my pleasure. Hello? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a real pleasure hearing all the stalwarts. And I'm sure the students uh, understood it was the basics done by Dr. Shilpa. And then, of course, Dr. Uh, you know, Kajal did the good, such a good job on the epidural techniques. And, of course, the tips and tricks by Ketan. I mean, we couldn't be more lucky to have uh, than them uh, taking this webinar. And... Thank you so much because the basics are so important and Dr. Shilpa did it so well and dealing with the drugs, it's the daily things that we are really encountering and then having problems which uh, Dr. Uh, Ketan answered. I can see another question. I think the questions will go on and they can be answered later. So thank you very much and for this lovely webinar. We truly enjoyed it and we ourselves have got educated. And uh, thank you. And we'll all be seeing you all next week as well. And uh, next week, again, we have mechanical ventilation, the third module. So if you can see the whole program over there. So thanks a lot, Shilpa, Kajal, and Dr. Ketan. Thanks a lot for being there today. And thank you, Sanish. And thank you, Devalina. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you. Thank nice you seeing so you. Much. Yes. Bye, Kajal. Bye, Shilpa. Thank you.